In this Alan Tejo Wines episode, I'm speaking to Ian Richardson from the wine estate Michel. Michel is a great example of an integrated estate in Alan Tejo, where different flora and fauna are interwoven to create the whole. The sobrero, or cork trees, are an integral part of the history of this region, and yet, as Ian tells us, Climate is one of the drivers that is causing substantial die-off against which he and his team are fighting. For reference, the Aurora mentioned in this recording is actually a measure used for weighing cork, equivalent to 15 kilograms. The story of Michaud is one that really marries the past with the present in terms of identifying the moment where history and tradition are faced with the need for non-linear responses in order to achieve sustainability. It is the story that really connects the glass of wine or jug of olive oil to the seemingly infinite physical and chemical interactions within the biosphere. It is also the great human challenge to adapt to these changes and to regenerate our soils, build resilience and learn to live in a different world. This feeds back into the importance of what programmes like WASP can achieve when they provide the framework for measuring change and disseminating knowledge. An additional note, Ian also refers to the Winkler scale, which is a system that classifies land areas or terroirs into a scale of one to five, depending on the number of growing degree days over the course of a growing season. A growing degree day is counted when the mean average temperature for that day is over 10 degrees Celsius or 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Each number on the Winkler scale is purported to indicate what grapes might grow in what climate and what quality might be expected, with 2 and 3 being optimal. Although widely regarded as limited in its evaluation of any particular terroir, the scale does provide a crude metric for showing how climates are changing. Okay. Ian, it's, it's great to speak to you. Can we just start by talking about Michel and the legacy of the estate? Well, Michel is based in the Alentejo, which is southern Portugal. It's actually, everyone talks about it being south of Lisbon, but it's actually not. We're actually parallel with Lisbon. We're only about 40 k's from the Spanish uh, border. So we're right across into Portuguese hinterland here, which is much, much hotter than the, the coastal coastal regions. A little bit of background, Morchal started in the, the Reynolds family. That's my mother's side of the family. It started in the Reynolds family roughly in the 1830s when the first Reynoldses came down from Porto. So many of the English families did start in Porto in those days with the port wine business. And they came down to change their business um, setup to producing cork. They moved down here in the 1830s and they ended up by being sort of the Amorines of their day. They had hundreds of properties which they rented across southern Spain and southwestern Spain and Portugal and uh, became quite influential as a, as a family back in the 1800s. They did maintain, though, two properties that made wine. One was Quinto do Carmo and the other one was here at Morchão. So they still kept that little bug behind their ear, as they say in Portuguese, for making wine. In terms of the, the approach to winemaking you take today, because I mean, we're, we want to talk about the climate impact on the Alentejo, if you like, but mm -hmm. how has winemaking changed at Michel, let's say, over the last 100 years or so? Okay, well... Um, we really hadn't changed it at all. So the actual winery, whilst the first vineyards were planted here, probably in the mid to late 1800s, we were certainly the first in Portugal to plant Alicante Boucher, which is really our signature variety here. The winery itself, it was known as the new winery, was built in, uh, between 1901 and 1904. Just with lagars, we've, we have hand basket presses. So we're very much stuck in a tan capsule here for many years before we had electricity put in 1991. And really, it was the electricity that's made the biggest change. That said, the change was really only reduced to being able to make white wines with um, refrigeration, the odd pump benefit from, from must pump, and cooling the lagars as well. So otherwise, our winemaking is exactly the same today as it was back in 1901. So we still tread all our grapes. 100% of our red wines are trodden. We are faced with all sorts of challenges there, particularly in the light of climate change, only in the sense that, whereas most wineries would look at acidity and sugars at harvest time, we always have to look at um, stems as well because of its 100% stems. 
And that is an issue because it's a three-way balance. You're not only trying to balance off your acidities against your sugar levels, but you're also trying to make sure that your stems have got the right coloration. They're not too dark green. You don't get too many herbaceous um, characters in your wine. But that's that's becoming an issue with climate change because trying to get that three, three-way balance right is, is a bit of a, a juggling game. Okay. And when, did you, when would you say that sort of climate change fingerprint first became noticeable? Well, officially, it started from the 1950s, and I'm talking about Alentejo data. And since then, it's gone up roughly 0.6. And this data that I'm giving you now is probably five to eight years old. So it's probably gone up by a bit more. But from the 1950s, the temperature has climbed here. And we are already officially in the old Winkler scale, we're climate five, but we're actually off the scale of climate five. Um, not us here in the Alente- in Morshaw particularly, but the southern Alentejo is off the scale. So we're really getting to that point where we're testing our varieties and testing plants in general almost, because we do have days when we're up to 45 for three or four days in a row. And I've um, really out of experience more than anything else, and there's no real science behind what I'm saying in, in the sense that it's not necessarily heat or lack of water, but it seems to be that the longer, it's the duration of these heat periods that really sort of impacts us most. Okay. It's not the fact that we have what the odd day at 46 degrees that will knock the production out. It's really, if it's sustained and we have nighttime temperatures that rarely get below 28, say, and that becomes an issue, you know. Okay, so they sort of consecutive days are yeah. an issue. Uh, what about, um, is there any impact, <clears throat> do you think, on the style of the wine that's being produced, or are you still able to to sort of produce the goods, if you like? Um, I don't think there is. As I said, we've got this issue with, a, with the maturation, um, with the, the, our maturation parameters, which we have to juggle with. I think it, it goes back to, to old-fashioned winemaking here because the old maître de chez, Jean Labassa, he used to make his wines in with uh, a lot of hang time, you'd put it. In, in Australian terms, you'd call it hang time. But he would harvest a lot of those... Um, I'm going back to the 50s, 60s and 70s. He would harvest uh, his grapes sometimes with, with potentially 18 alcohol and then just use the old um, the old hose trick, which is uh, which is what everyone's been doing since Roman times. There's nothing I mean, it sounds scandalous to so many people, but that's how it used to be made. So some old Morshals were quite plummy, not all of them. The best weren't, but um, they were quite plummy. What we're doing nowadays, we're taking a lot more care. We're not giving it that hang time, obviously. We do like a little bit tiny bit of berry shrivel not to the point where a lot of people have those um that experience with syrah or something like that in in australia but you have a little bit of shrivel on the on the berry and uh, that to us is usually um our picking one of our let's call it our visual picking points as well but yes the climate has changed quite a lot to me but you know again a lot of this is is you have to, we have to be careful on how we reach our conclusions because it could be seen to be confirmation bias because I'm sort of rather obsessed by the heat these days. And, uh, but I do think that the last, let's say, 12 years, 15 years have really become quite something for us. Okay. And it, we're, we're always looking out for problems related to heat. And so we do um, some of our pruning and vine training to try and mitigate that. We try and let the sort of, or most of our vineyards are no longer, you know, if you go back to the sunlight into wine, Richard Smart, he would always say north-south. Of course, none of us do that anymore. Our experience now tells us that it is east-west and you do need the canopy to hook, to try and hang over the southern the southern facing side of the, of the canopy. Another thing we're doing is we realise that our most resilient vineyards are those that have no irrigation at all. Even though we do use some irrigation in our more skeletal soils in the far end of the property it's always those on the valley floors that we use no irrigation our oldest vineyards our best vineyards let's say that uh, are most resilient so all our plantings in the last three to four years whilst we do have irrigation installed it is really only for the first three to five years let's say that said i put zero irrigation into our new newest vineyard which is only it's tiny it's only three hectares the idea being is we just i bought a 8000 liter cistern and with 50 meter hoses 2 meter on, on the back and we're just using that to irrigate for the first 3 to 5 years and we're forgetting irrigation altogether now that's a slightly dangerous game especially especially when you're looking at vines which are fully adapted to your ir- irrigation system and in some vineyards it wasn't the best it was rather frequent and rather short each, each irrigation. So when we are irrigating, and if we do irrigate, I should say, 
we're looking to do uh, maybe only three irrigations a year and just absolutely flood it. We're talking 35 to say 55 liters per plant and then leave it for six weeks. That is what we were trying to do in those vineyards, which are most reliant still. In other words, they've got a very high rooting system, shallow rooting system. And that's my way of trying to, without damaging the vine, as it were, or, or compromising its growth and metabolism, is just trying to keep it without going over the top in terms of dependency on the water in the in the top 20 to 40 centimeters, say. Okay. So... It's just the, the regime has changed slightly, but it's very dangerous to do that too much. I know a lot of people just want to just cut out irrigation. You can't do that. A vine won't let you do that if it's over sort of 15, 20 years old. But generally speaking, we're look, looking forward, we're, we're dry farming everything. Okay. And um, when I visited, it was very apparent that the, the vineyards themselves sit within a more complex ecosystem of, of the estate itself. You had a, lots of different aspects to it. Can you talk a little bit about the climate change impact across the estate going beyond the vineyards? Yes, um, that's probably where we're feeling it most if we're looking at plant by plant or plant species by plant species, because probably cork trees are the ones that are suffering the most. We used to have roughly 60,000 arobas, and one aroba is 15 kilos, so that's in a 10-year cycle. Just to give you a relative number, it doesn't mean much. If I, it's rather too many numbers I'm giving you now, Nick. But um, we're probably looking at 25 years later. We're looking at roughly 40 to 45 aerobics. So that's how many trees we've lost um, in our 900 hectare estate. So when I first arrived here back in 2014, early 2015, the mortality rate was enormous. We had roughly 800, 600, 800 trees every year which would die, and these are lovely old oaks. And it was absolutely tragic for us. And, you know, I'd sit here on a Saturday afternoon watching these huge trucks of, of uh, wood struggling to climb the hill here. And it was, um, it was pretty heartbreaking. So what we've done since then is we planted 30,000 trees in the last three years, cork trees. Obviously, we're not expecting them all to take. We've got all sorts of other issues here as well, which you could argue are climate related because it impacts the fauna. So we've got a, a predominance now of things like wild boar, which do a lot of damage and chew our new, our new trees. Anyway, it's an issue for us. It's a real issue in the, with the cork. And we're going to plant another 15,000 cork trees in the next two years. And so we're sort of reaching our where we want to be. But now we've got to manage the property in a way that's sustainable looking forward because it's very much down to machinery now. It's not just climate change, but although it is related because the trees become stressed, the more you use disc plows, for example. So we're, we're now getting into cutting undergrowth rather than using disc plows to, to plow it in because 40% of all roots in, each, in a cork tree are on the, in the top 20 centimetres. So it, they're very susceptible to, to damage by, by humans. So, right. And it's become clear that that was the policy since the 1960s, that the only way to manage a silva pastoral system, in other words, a tree and, and, um, and animal and livestock system, was to use disc plows for the last 50, 60 years. And we've realized that has actually been a, a big mistake. In the early days, we would use oxen with one single plow. And it sounds a bit uh, archaic, but that's not very long time ago here at Moshau. I'd say even 35 years ago, we were doing that. And in those days, there wasn't so much damage done. But now with, with heavy machinery and disc plows going deeper, we're really starting to do a lot of damage and the trees are suffering. And it's all, it's mostly secondary damage. We've got um, fungal, but mostly uh, coleopteras, uh, wood borers of various sorts, which are, are basically finishing the trees off. Do you think there are, are knowledge gaps that you, in terms of, because it sounds like what you're edging towards is a more regenerative approach where you, the, where you kind of have a natural resilience within the, the estate. Are there knowledge gaps in how you're doing? I mean, how do you get your knowledge? How do you feed in the expertise, if you like, or the experience? I think, Nick, it's, we have reasonably close relationships with the universities. We actually had some trials done here in the 1990s with every university. But most of what we're trying to do now is basically it's, it's empiricism. We're just sort of working on what we've done and what we know, the history of what we've done to certain plots within the property. For example, there are some areas which we used to toil quite a lot with our disc plows. And uh, I would the tendency was always to blame it on climate change, but it, 
it, the climate change doesn't stop at the fence, if you know what I mean. And there were sort of blocks where you could clearly see there was something going on. So it was really just down to that. And then talking to a lot of people in forestry, and we've got a very good advisor now working with us. We're now FSC certified as well. So we do consult a lot with them. We've got a forestry plan, which we were about to renovate. We do have to renovate every five years. We're doing it this month. So we're just constantly trying to reassess what we're doing as we go along. Okay. And obviously... In the wine world, doesn't matter where you are in the world, sustainability is kind of a hot topic. Everybody's talking about their sustainable credentials, if you like. How do you perceive it from inside Michelle? Is it it something that you're overtly conscious of? Is it something that's happening naturally? Is it something, you know, how do you factor it in? From a wine point of view? Um, Well, from the estate point of view, I guess, as a sort of whole system. Okay, it's very much early days in the sense that there's there are not many obvious ways to go, let's put it that way, yet, because I know this is probably within the next three to five years, they're going to be structured means by which we can apply for subsidies or this, that and the other, or or tap into markets and so on. But we're very much at this sort of embryonic phase still of working out what we really need to do to make the whole of Montchamp more sustainable. 70% of the property is forest, so we've got that largely covered by the FSC norms, and we're about to buy into their ecosystem services program, which will be very, very valuable, and it'll give us a baseline which we can then work on and maybe adapt that to sort of B2B market situation for people who might want to offset on that outside of the business. We do want to look at everything on a whole farm basis. So what I mean by that is the other 30% of the property, which is largely fields or arable land, which we use for sowing hay for our organic sheep. So we need to certify that on the one hand. So that's one side of things. And then we've also got the vineyards and the olives, which obviously, because we're not organic, and I'm, I'm okay with that, if you know what I mean. Everyone wants to be organic these days, but there are much bigger things and there's a much bigger picture out there. So when it comes to organic farming, we're going down that route with forestry and with the sheep, but it's such a big risk with things like olives and, and wine at this stage. Though it is somewhere I'm, I'm exploring, for example, the new vineyard that we've just planted, the three hectares, which are not going to be irrigated, they will probably end up by being We'll trial trial them as an organic because they're quite separate from the rest of our vineyards. So we're looking into that. But I've been a consultant in viticulture for too many years now. And um, people always, I've always had clients who wanted to go down the organic route and it always ended up, you know, going belly up. Even though you'd say, well, give it another three years. You've got to do, you know, you've got to be able to do it for three to five years and then see how it goes. It's 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 a it's a very difficult route. That's all I can say. I know it sounds very sexy to, to a lot of people. It's just a very difficult route to, to take from the economic point of view. But we're looking at it, very much looking at it from the vineyards and our olives as well. You're joining the Wines of Alentejo Sustainability Programme. How do you see your interaction with them? And what's your level of expectation versus what you want to get out of it? I think it's critical. I think they've, they've done an absolutely wonderful job. They're, they're leaders in Portugal when it comes to in terms of wine regions, they're the leaders in terms of sustainability. And they're keeping us all, um, you know, thinking all the time about what we're doing. We have been doing integrated production, I think that's what you call it in English, practices now for well over 20 years. And so it's not as though we're doing anything we shouldn't, you know what I mean? Do you think there's a way that a programme like the Wines of Alentejo Sustainability Programme, is there some way that they could help with some of the challenges you're facing? But I know that it, Whatever future technologies do lead down that route, it'll it'll they'll be on it. So I think it's just the conscientialization that they're putting us on our toes all the time and keeping us thinking about what we're doing. We have a lot of uh, documentation to keep filling in and really rethink all the time what we're doing. And I like that. And I think it works very, very well. Obviously, from the commercial point of view, it helps as well. There are some markets where gatekeepers are very strict about what kind of wines they accept. That helps too. In fact, that's the driver for a lot of people. But in our case, you know, this is an old farm and I really want to keep the place as as pristine as possible. I think it's very important that we're open as farmers and as grape growers and as um, olive growers. We're very open about what we do and why we do it. I chaired a panel at the COP in Glasgow and I had someone from who was an advisor to the White House in the Obama period. And she's written a book on adaptation. 
and she was okay. head of the National Security Council. And what she was saying is that the past is no longer an indicator for the future. Whatever we think we are expecting, we're actually on a path of exponential change. And because of that, we need to be kind of living in the present and anticipating. And a lot of our failures will be from a failure of imagination to be able to anticipate what's coming. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be playing into a lot of what you're saying is that things are happening. And sometimes you, you've got practices that you rely on and sometimes things are happening which you can't control. I'm just wondering, you know, how do you view the future going forward from here over the next sort of 10 to 30 years, for example? I think a lot of it is, is fear. You know, if you're a farmer and you're seeing your crop, just all the leaves falling off your, your vines, for example, you always wonder, I mean, you can't let it happen. I mean, you just can't. I mean, you just spent all your, the whole agricultural year and, many seasons, let's say, just, just looking after your vineyards as though they're a, they're a son or a daughter, you know what I mean? And just suddenly seeing the whole thing. Um, that said, somebody who is probably fully organic will probably say, well, you can't, you know, you've got to look after the soil and all this and stuff. But in such extreme growing conditions, it didn't used to be extreme. Let's be honest about the Atlantic. We never had the same problems they would have, for example, in more rainy countries. You know, France, you'd have to do a lot more spraying. And so we were quite lucky, not as lucky as zones and parts of Chile, but we were quite lucky, generally speaking. But now with climate change, it's becoming much more of a, a challenge. We've got mites, spider mites, um, leafhoppers, all sorts of things, which are, you know, with any monoculture and anything over a hectare could be considered a monoculture. We've got 43 hectares of vines here, although it's, they're very, very, very much planted in a mosaic pattern around the property because we've got other sort of islands within the property where we don't go at all. We just let nature do it and take its course. But bugs are, are probably our biggest threat. And obviously heat is probably the main one, but it's very closely tied, obviously, with water availability and, you know, the actual breathing of leaves. I think probably the future, part of the future might be in that, in the genetically modified vines, if you like. I don't know, but we're looking at, you know, things like isohydric, activity in a vine and anisohydric activity of stomas opening and stuff like that that could be a way of keeping you know parts of the wine growing world more sustainable for a longer time i, I don't know we've got we've got into this mess now with playing with manipulating um, stuff so in many crops there's absolutely no way back as you know and um, it has its upsides too and i don't know okay. i don't know but i i just i just don't know where, we, where we're going to end up with um in the future, I know we're on a, we're on the edge here in in the Ellen Edge. We're right on the edge. In fact, I think it was uh, Gregory V. Jones who wrote that. Um, this is back in two thousand and five, if I'm not mistaken. He wrote that the Ellen Edge, or what he called termed Southern Portugal, he chose twenty eight wine growing regions in the world, and he picked out Southern Portugal as being the most vulnerable, which is quite interesting. And that's why I did my thesis in you know, Edinburgh on, precisely on this subject. You're kind of on that front line of the Sahara spreading north in a way. Mm -hmm. So very much. That's yeah. why I found what you're talking about so interesting is because you are that line of defense. So I think quite a lot of us have an interest an interest in your survival. Um, in, yeah. a, you know, in a much more different lens, look from standing back. This to finish on really is the profile that you're that you're presenting is one that is very much rooted in this sort of integrated estate on the front lines of climate change, adapting with best practices wherever possible. When you pour a glass of wine for a consumer, for example, for a taster, what's the profile you want to convey to them? Is, is it about any of well, this? Well, I'd be going more to, towards, Nick, I'd going, be going more towards the much abused word terroir here, um, because really what we're trying to do here at Morshell is express what's in the vineyard uh, in our wines. And, and what we're trying to do is just nurture the vines as best as possible in those really, really tricky months to help the grapes express what that particular piece of terroir is all about. We've really got two vineyards here, which we're particularly keen on, Carapietos Vineyard and the Dorada Vineyard. And those two uh, have very different characteristics of Alicante Boucher. And they're quite interesting and quite fun to, to play with, but they're very much express. And they, it's, it's very consistent year on year. But um, really what we're looking at is preserving that, the quality of the fruit in those bearing climate change in mind and everything else and all the other aspects, all the other inputs we have to apply, just bearing all that in mind to, to produce the best we possibly can. And it's becoming more and more of a challenge as, as we've been talking about. 
but um, it's still it's still fun, and it's we're still here and enjoying it. You know, that's what we do. Okay, well, wouldn't be here if it wasn't. In the next episode, I'll be speaking to Helena Ferreira, who's the director of Adega de Borba, a cooperative that is doing sustainability at scale.